<laughs> yes, then yeah. It's like when you get the proposal fund, then you have to do all the things you promised to do, right? Right. <laughs> That's right. And to write the proposal, but then if it gets funded, you get yeah, the, the thing about this is that they asked us to do this thing. We wrote a proposal, you know, in like not even 10 days. And then they told us, well, we're not going to give you the money. You might not see the money, you know, for three months. And I'm like, okay. So we are, we're going out to sea without even having gotten a response oh, right? from NSF. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is the rapid response thing, right? It's so, so rapid like, that, that you don't even get the money. <laughs> It's like, whoop. <laughs> so I hope we get the money. You know, we so, had an embarrassing situation like this last summer that some of our lectures didn't get a contract at the until the end of summer. So they were teaching the whole summer, not no, not having a piece of paper in hand, which is not a good way to go. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, we talked to the to NSF and they told us, you know, to and you know NSF, they always tell you some, but not all. And so mm -hmm. they were always, you know, pretty tight-lipped. And you're like, okay, we're going to do this, and you're going to force us to work. And it's always, you know, Two hundred thousand dollars. Then you need to do, you know, seismics. You need to do seismics in. You need to do high resolution in three thousand meters of water without large sources. And I'm like, anything else? <laughs> this is probably a good practical talk for another seminar, for especially for grad students and early career people. But I should probably let you get, give your actual presentation. No, it's it's, it, it's like how do you actually. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you deal with NSF? <laughs> that will be another talk. Yes. There you go. All right. So um, I think it's time to start. Um, it's uh, it's almost four uh, two. Um, hi everyone. Um, today I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Beatrice Maniani from SMU. Um, I want to give you a little bit of information about her and her background. Beatrice is a seismologist and her research interest is mostly related to the continental dynamics. Uh, she did a PhD in earth science in 2000 in, uh, at University of Perugia in Italy and then she moved to, uh, to United States doing a postdoc for five years at Rice University and later in 2006, uh, she joined to faculty uh, as a faculty member to Center of Earthquake Research and uh, Information uh, at University of Memphis. And uh, she was there until 2013 and after she moved to uh, SMU. And today she's going to talk about um, the subject that you see, the solid earth response to the glaciers. And um, by giving this uh, information, I invite Beatrice to take a scene and, and uh, talk about his uh, project. And I, I appreciate um, in this busy time that you accepted to uh, give this talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's actually a pleasure to speak to uh, the neighbors, I will say. Uh, we, don't, we don't see each other enough, clearly. So. Um, this gives me the opportunity to talk about a project that um, we started, um, I started, I conceived a long time ago, but um, it actually came into being uh, only recently. And um, as you see, it's about the solid earth response of the Patagonia Andes to glacial retreat. And by no means, this is my work. It's uh, uh, today I'm going to be presenting some of the preliminary uh, results of, of the work we've been doing, but it is actually the collaborative work of uh, 
myself, the, the team at SMU, uh, that is also my um, graduate students, Anastasia Fedorova, and what we call the Guanaco team. And if you don't know what a Guanaco is, it's uh, this uh, little animal that is omnipresent down in Patagonia, and we made it uh, the symbol and the logo of our team. So the team is made up of um, the LACOR group at the University of Minnesota, the uh, uh, team, uh, the seismologist, the Doug Wins and the postdocs at University at Washington University of St. Louis and um, JPL, um, our colleagues at JPL, and is funded by uh, the National Science Foundation. So um, let's start. Um, so we, I'm going to start from the perspective of the glacier. So we know that the world's ice is, um, is, is melting at pretty fast rates and we know those rates are actually accelerating. And uh, between 1994 and 2017, the earth has lost about 28 trillion tons of ice. So that ice that has, uh, is melting is contributing to uh, sea level rise, particularly the grounding, uh, the grounded ice losses have contributed to about 35 millimeters uh, in of sea level rise uh, over the, uh, the 24 years. One fourth of that ice uh, comes from glaciers. So, um, and when we look at the contribution of uh, glaciers, and this is an image that is coming from space uh, gravimetry data, particularly uh, GRACE, we see that there are particularly hot spots of ice loss, and they are, you know, dominated by uh, Alaska, by Greenland, and by South America, the Patagonia ice shields. And those are the ones that are contributing to about a half, a half an inch, 13 millimeters to uh, global sea level rises. So here, what I'm showing you are, you know, this, the amount of uh, ice loss, the mass in gigaton over a, a time span between 2003 and 2018. Again, this is uh, data coming from GRACE, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in gigaton that shows just the Southern Andes contribution to this ice loss. And, and it shows that, the southern Andes are contributing to about 30 gigaton per year in ice loss. So when, when uh, um, the ice melts on land, the solid earth responds by adjusting. And particularly, you know, what this little cartoon shows here is that as the ice is melting here, you know, the, the earth, the solid earth responds by uh, deloading or uplifting, right? In the process that we call the glacial isostatic adjustment or GIA. And so um, in this process, it, when you think of it, the process of, um, from the perspective of, of the earth's surface, you know, the glacial isostatic adjustment is uh, the lithosphere and mantle component of a dynamically interactive earth system that begins with a climate change, right? And the, uh, the rate and the magnitude of this response are controlled by the viscosity of what we interpret as the fluid la layers, which in this case is the mantle, where in the thickness of the elastic layer, which in this case is the lithosphere, controls the uh, wavelength of the response. But also, you know, the, the signal is controlled by how the, the, the load or the ice in this case is removed and how this load is, this removal is distributed and how fast, right? So, which means that from the uh, climatic point of view, this centennial scale and millennial scale transport of ice, the lithosphere changes and the mantle uh, changes that define the glacial isostatic adjustment are key indicator of significant environmental change that impact you know, fields that are going uh, as far removed as mantle physics and paleolimnology and affect anthropology. So uh, this is to say that when we study GIA, we're actually going to touch um, parameters that are relevant to mantle viscosity and therefore uh, 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 convection in the mantle, for example. 
and uh, and and uh, we're actually going to uh, have to study um, parameters that are uh, re related to uh, uh, glacier erosions and rates and patterns that are con that, that that are uh, for GIA. They are controlled by mantle rheology and ice mass distribution over time, and and that means that any reasonable uh, GIA model must treat both the earth structure and the climate, uh, in this case, as the forcing of the ice mass, with nearly equal um, fidelity and rigor. So in this case, you know, we are going to be talking, you know, as um, in this talk, we're going to be talking about estimate of past ice volumes from the geomorphological constraint. And these are going to be affecting, you know, uh, the, uh, the estimates of GIA that we can give in this in in in, in Southern Patagonia ice fields, and uh, these are going to be um, informed by processes of erosions and and sediment transfer. So addressing GIA and 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 the ice loss has also revealed uh, recently. This is a paper by Pippa Whitehouse, two thousand eighteen. We're learning that as um, the ice is is melting and the, uh, the solid earth is uh, responding, the, uh, the solid earth is actually affecting how the ice is moving and, uh, and, uh, and sliding. In general, we know that the far field ice melts leads to a local sea level rise, which is I just, I just mentioned, causing a retreat in the, grinding, in the grounding line, where the grounding line is the point at which the ice sheet is starting to float, right? So, which is illustrated here. In the first, in the first uh, slide here. So as the ice is melting, you know the ice thinned, and there is a local increase in sea level, uh, and therefore the grounding line recedes, and more ice is lost. But what we're learning here is that when there is a, a near field ice melt, there is actually a response in uh, by the the solid earth which has an effect that is stabilizing on the ice sheet, meaning that as the ice sheet is melting, the, the response of the solid earth makes, uh, forces the uh, grounding line to move forward and therefore stabilize the, the ice sheet. So we're actually learning that in those places where the ice uh, melts fast and the mantle is uh, low viscosity enough, we actually see that the ice loss might be um, uh, slowed down thanks to the response of the um, solid earth. So if you want to start a, a GIA, you know, there are many places where you could do that. One of the best places we found out is in the Southern Patagonia ice fields. So why is that a, a, a one of the best places to study GIA? So the it turns out that the Southern Patagonia ice fields are one of the best natural laboratories to study glacial isostatic adjustment. This region, which is here, is, was covered by, uh, by the late Pleistocene Patagonia ice sheet, which extended uninterrupted all over uh, the Southern Andes during the last glacial maximum. And here, the last glacial maximum, maximum ended about 16,000 years ago. And during the deglaciation, the Patagonia ice field retreated to the present configuration that is now uh, looking like uh, formed by three separate ice, ice fields, the Northern Patagonia ice field, the Southern Patagonia ice field, and the Cordillera Darwin. And uh, the Northern Patagonia, Patagonian and the Southern Patagonia ice field are the largest temperate ice complex in, uh, on Earth. And they are by far the largest in the Southern hemisphere outside Antarctica. And so they provide, you know, one of the best ways, not just to study GIA, but actually to study temperate glaciers response to climate in the Southern hemisphere, again, outside Antarctica. So it's one of the best um, uh, location to really address climate change and ice uh, and solid earth response to climate change. So today we're going to focus on the Southern Patagonia ice field, one of the three ice sheets in this uh, in this region. So here we're seeing the evolution from uh, the last glacial maximum to today. Today, the Southern Patagonia ice fields are still a, a paleoclimatological laboratory. They're still losing um, 
uh, ice masses at a pretty um, fast rate. They've been rapidly thinning over the past 50 years. And they, you know, this shows the uh, change in elevation, again, from uh, satellite uh, space uh, altimetry. In the last uh, six years, in 2011, 2017, this shows uh, rapid changes in elevation, which means translating rapid ice losses, especially in the northern portion of the southern Patagonia ice field, with uh, peak ice losses of two gigaton per year, right? And associated with this ice loss, which is not completely homogeneous, which is something that you should already uh, uh, notice, we observe very fast uplift rate um, as measured by uh, GPS data. And what you're seeing here, these are, uh, this is a paper published by Richter in 2016, this, this uh, dots here show the position of the station all uh, uh, around the Southern Patagonia ice fields. And the size of the dots provide the uncertainty, if you wish, the larger the dot, the, 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 the uh, smaller the uh, uncertainty. And, um, and the, the darker the dot, the greater the uplift rate. So you see that some uplift rates are actually in the order of four centimeters a year, which is, you know, an, an, incredible, an incredible uplift rate, especially compared to tectonic rates, right? So these rates, these uplift, vertical uplift rates are associated, uh, they're thought to be related to glacial isostatic adjustment, because mostly they are um, around the area of the ice fields that are losing uh, ice rapidly today. So these areas are also uh, exceptional for the position that they, uh, that they, uh, they have. The Pagania ice fields are located tectonically on top of a structure that um, is called a, a slab window. They are located astride what is called the, uh, astride the, the, volcan the uh, austral uh, volcanic zone located on top of the subducting slab between the Antarctic uh, plate and the South American plate. And uh, the Andean, um, uh, Austral Andean volcanic are formed when the um, Antarctic plate subducted. And, and in this case, this region has been crossed by uh, the Chile triple junction located here today and it's formed by the Nazca Antarctica South America plate. And this triple junction, which today is located here, has been migrated northward for the past 17 million years, leaving behind a structure that we call the slab window, right? The slab window, which you can see here, is a slab, is a, is a structure that is literally a, that is a subducting uh, middle oceanic ridge that continues to open, right? And therefore exposes the, uh, the region of the austral uh, volcanic zone to possible mantle upwelling. And therefore might have resulted to an anomalously thin lithosphere, <clears throat> sorry, thin lithosphere and an anomalously and unusually possibly hot and low viscosity upper mantle. So if we are to think about glacial isostatic adjustment, so imagine this is the structure that sits at the bottom of the melting ice sheet, right? So from the GIA perspective, such condition of very low viscosity upper mantle and anomalously thin lithosphere so from the perspective of the uh, GIA uh, conditions, these conditions will be reflected in an exceptionally short isostatic response time to this surface load variation. You can think of uh, GIA, you know, as for those of you that are not used to think about geodynamic processes like this, as the effect that a load, like imagine to put a bowling ball, on top of a mattress, right? That's the load, imagine that's the ice 
And imagine that the mattress is the combined effect of the lithosphere and the metal. As you put the, the bowling ball to the mattress, the mattress flexes down. And as you remove the bowling ball, the, the mattress rebounds back up. Now, how fast that mattress rebounds back up, obviously, is a function of the type of mattress, but also of the uh, weight of the bowling ball. In this case, obviously, if the, if the mattress is, uh, is a memory form, imagine, then you have a, a, the, the anomaly, the, 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 the load of the bowling ball will be very narrow and very deep. But if you have a very hard uh, mattress, then the anomaly of the bowling ball, the, 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 the flexor of the mattress will be very wide and not very deep, right? So imagine that in this case, you have a, a, a mattress that is very similar to your uh, memory foam mattress. It is very low viscosity and therefore it will tend to rebound very fast and very narrow right around the region of the uh, volcanic, of the uh, Southern Patagonia ice fields. So in this case, we will expect that these conditions uh, will have very uh, extreme changes very fast and or rather, rather very short isostatic response times to service load variations. And, you know, compare, for example, to, um, to the Fenoscandian values. And it is reasonable to even think that the response of uh, GIA in this region might operate over time scales that are in the order of decades or centuries, and perhaps even on par with the changes in eye loss with the little ice age rather than the last glacial maximum. So many um, uh, GIA models have been uh, proposed for this region and a lot of progress has been made to understand what is causing such an exceptional response four, four centimeters a year of uplift around this ice field. And yet, you know, there is a certain ambiguity in the GIA models. And again, GIA models, you know, are fed by the two components of the system, the load at the system, at the, at the surface, and the rheology of the solid earth, which is the lithosphere and mantle combined uh, re uh, rheology. So, and despite the fact that we have a lot of progress that's been made to uh, generate models of GIA in Patagonia, we find that these uh, solutions are not unique and mostly because the, the mental viscosity solutions are you know, uh, ambiguous because they can, they can provide, and what you're seeing here, these are two different uh, mental viscosity solution for an elastic lithosphere thickness of about 35, 36 uh, kilometers that can produce the same uplift that we observe today by using two different models for ice um, um, uh, load removal since the Little Ice Age. So that means that, that we cannot actually have a, uh, the, 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 the mental viscosity solutions are not unique. And in fact, they differ of about as a, by as much as an order of magnitude. And so the resolution of this uniqueness, you know, in the end boils down to the surface load history mostly to the post Little Ice Age and to our ability to discriminate between these two models, which are model A and model B, which are uh, showing that, you know, are, 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 are two models that have been proposed of how the ice has been retreating since the Little Ice Age. And model A shows a very rapid losing of the ice mass following the Little Ice Age uh, maximum. maximum. And then, you know, with the ice loss that slows down or even, you know, gains some mass um, uh, uh, during the retreat, and then begins to retreat at, at, at the contemporary uh, rates, and versus a model B, which instead shows that the ice fields are exhibiting very little response after the ice age, and then pick up to start exponentially lose ice at the uh, at the at the rates at which we're seeing them today. So with the information we have today, we cannot discriminate between you know, these two models and therefore we cannot account for uh, um, 
what causes, you know, what is yeah, what is Patagonia responding to today? Whether it's re responding to the ice loss since the Little Ice Age, or is responding to uh, uh, ice loss since the last glacial maximum, or you know, any um, uh, re-advance in between. So, in order to understand this, we built a a project, the Guanaco project, that um, investigates the solid Earth response to an evolving cryosphere at the surface in the Panagonian uh, tectonic setting by addressing four elements of the system, which are the rheology of the solid earth, understanding how the mantle and the, and the lithosphere are actually um, uh, built, how they're built, what is the viscosity, what is the, their rheology, what is their uh, structure in 3D, by addressing the change in ice and rock load at the surface, how these loads are distributed, and what is the timing of that surface load. And then by feeding all this uh, uh, observational constraint to the geodynamic modeling. And so we have, you know, this group of investigators that I put together, you know, are these elements of the, of the, uh, of the project are investigated by using four different approach. We have used lithospheric seismic imaging and rheological uh, analysis to address this, the mantle structure. We, uh, we use lacustrine lac stratigraphic and structural imaging and lacustrine cores and dating and little stratigraphic analysis to get at the surface load and the timing of that load. And then we are aided by a, a land um, and outcrop uh, analysis with radiocarbon dating to uh, aid in the interpretation of the uh, subaqueous uh, information that we're getting in the lacustrine um, imaging. And then we're feeding that into GIA modeling. And so today I'm gonna mostly talk about the lacustrine uh, stratigraphic and structural imaging, but I wanna give a, a shout out to the rest of the group and show you, you know, what the rest of the people have done. And so I'm gonna, you know, show you the mantle structure uh, velocity structure, we uh, deployed an array of 28 broadband stations around the Southern Patagonia ice, school, ice field, and they have recorded over 24 months, much longer than actually we had planned because some of the stations got trapped down there during COVID. And so we had to leave them in the field about a year longer than we had planned. And these are the triangle uh, here. And uh, the uh, analysis is actually being integrated with existing and uh, station from permanent network, both in Chile and Argentina. And what you're seeing here is, this is the resulting um, images of the mantle, uh, different slices of 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, and 150 kilometers that are showing that the, um, the slab window is very uh, evident in the mantle, especially in, to the north near the slab window where this is the triple junction, the, the Chile triple junction. At 50 kilometers, we see, we see a very strong uh, velocity anomaly uh, to the north. And there is a very strong velocity gradient from north to south with, you know, associated with the velocity anomalies, you know, associated with the uh, Chile triple junction. And we expect, just to go back, we expect that this will strongly affect the heterogeneity of the uplift uh, at the surface. And then, you know, we are addressing the surface load with land mapping. This is the group of Minnesota that has been uh, with our colleagues in Argentina that has been uh, uh, mapping the morainal um, systems. These are the last glacial maximum moraines and the um, uh, Little Ice Age moraines. This is we're right in front of the glacier Uppsala or glaciers that have been retreating aggressively in the last 50 years. And so we are, uh, we've been sampling both the last uh, Little Ice Age moraines and the Pleistocene uh, related deposit, you know, whether they are morainal ridges, terraces or exposed bedrock to constrain the post Little Ice Age ice behavior and to reconstruct the, the sedimentary records and, and the loading history. And, you know, we are going to, gather all this uh, field and, and model-based constraint to define the parameter space for the next generation of GIA models for Patagonia. So we're gonna 
get all this information in as an input to the GIA model, you know, and these are going to be the seismic uh, inversion for the solid earth, the ice and sedimentary loads and rates that we're going to be deriving from the uh, seismic images that I'm going to show you in a second, the coding information and the glacial geologic data, they're all going to be fed into this uh, geodynamic modeling that is going to be performed by Eric Irene's IJPL. Okay, so this is just the overview of the project. Now let's get to you know, the lacustrine part. So why did we, uh, so where did we do this? We, we are now, you know, let me explain you the uh, ice history of the region. We, we chose to conduct our seismic investigation to extract the uh, uh, sedimentary and uh, glacial history from the region we chose the uh, a proglacial lake, Lago, Lago Argentino, which is located just to the uh, eastern reaches of the Southern Patagonia ice field. Lago Argentino is fed by the meltwater that is derived by the Southern Patagonia ice field and gathers the sediments that are drained by eight large outlet glaciers. So it is one of the best uh, uh, places to study the sediments and the erosion uh, that is derived from all the movement of the ice. And this, uh, this area is also one of the best studied for the, um, the structures left behind by the ice uh, as it receded from the uh, position during the last glacial maximum. These are the morainal uh, structure of the last glacial maximum here called the El Tranquilo Moraine. As it, the ice retreated, uh, to the uh, to the west, and 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 is now located along the uh, Cordillera Patagonica here into the glacial valleys. So the uh, the um, the ice retreated uh, since uh, the last glacial maximum 16,000 16, years ago, and readvanced in several you know episodes. And here the um, the stages are uh, called the the uh, the late glaciation fluctuation during the Pleistocene and the new glaciation fluctuation during the Holocene. So in the late glacial, the ice receded all the way back into the valleys and then re-advanced about 13,000 years ago during what it might be represented as the younger dryas in South America and formed what is called the Puerto Bandera Moraine, a system that I will show you is preserved on land and very uh, uh, spectacularly uh, is in the submerged position in Lago Argentina. And then the, lay, the, the, the ice retreated, you know, in, in uh, at a series of oscillation and, and produced a series of, a sequence of Puerto Bandera one, Puerto Bandera two and Puerto Bandera three moraines. And then, you know, the last, you know, these are uh, uh, carbon years and uh, these are uh, calendar years. So be careful about mixing the two. But then before the ice, after the, the, the last advance during the Neo Glacier, receded all the way back and formed again during the last advance, the Hermita Moraine. So after the last late glacier minor re-advance of the Herminita Moraine, you know, this uh, moraine here, the ice was uh, marked by a, a marked glacier recession that occurred at the beginning of the, of the Holocene. The ice almost re, uh, retreated almost behind the present um, glacier uh, front and, uh, and then uh, re-advanced uh, in, in several pulses in, uh, in about, at, at about uh, 7,000 years. 6,000 years, 2,500 uh, 2, years, and so on. And there are seven different pulses that are all recorded by a system of moraines in the entrenched valleys in the uh, Paragonia Cordillera. And here you can see, now we are here in just in front of uh, Glacier Uppsala, you can see these moranal systems that are marking the, the oscillation of the ice during the uh, Holocene. And I'm showing, I'm spending more time here because we're gonna actually um, sh see these moranal uh, ridges in the, um, 
in the seismic images that I'm going to show you. And this is an image that my, uh, my, my graduate students uh, created using um, both uh, satellite images and uh, photographic images and it reconstructed the uh, position of the ice, both, both submerged and in a, on the surface, you know, for the past, uh, since, since the last glacial maximum, since the little ice, uh, little ice age about here, and as the ice retreated during uh, the last century, 1945, and then aggressively here until the present ice, form, uh, ice front. So uh, in 2019, so we chose so we chose this uh, this lake because again it shows it has very very well studied and dated land deposit for the ice uh, retreats, and it is uh, it it gathers all the drainage uh, deposit from these the the outlet glaciers, and so we chose this um, lake to. Um, acquire about uh, 350 kilometers of coincident, these are the lines that coincident uh, multi-channel seismic reflection data and chirp data to map in the uh, lake, the past and present ice frontal position of the ice, and then derive the sedimentation rates and the erosion rates, and from that to derive the retreat rates. So that, that this, this data can be fed into the um, uh, GIA modeling. And in addition to the seismic reflection data, we collected also, we extracted 45 uh, gravity and piston cores using a Coulombic uh, piston coring technique. And for a total of 108 uh, meters of cumulative sediments in the, in the lake. With, and, and that's the position of all the cores we, we extracted and the core, um, we, uh, they were dated at, at LACOR using a, a, count, a barbing counting uh, technique, and they range in age, in the core length, in age between 25 to 4,000 years. So they encompass you know, half of the Holocene, um, the positional uh, record. So I'll talk very little about the cores. I will mostly uh, talk about the reflection data we collected. So let's, let's get at it. So, so this is the, uh, we're in the lake now. We collected, for those of you that are uh, seismologically inclined, we used our SMU uh, acquisition system. We have a 12 kilohertz chirp, which is you know, located here. You know, we used a pontoon that uh, was towed uh, behind the boat. We used a, one, of the, um, one of the tourist boat that um, are actually taking the tourists around the lake. And we went during the winter so that we know that those tourist boats are not taking anybody around because it's them freezing over there. So um, this is our chirp. And, and as you see here, this is our uh, source. This is the boomer source. And this is our tail booing of the streamer. The streamer, the streamer has 24 channels and two meter group. And uh, we sample at 25 milliseconds and we shot at about uh, six meter um, uh, shot interval. And, um, and, and what you're seeing here, this is actually, this is located here. This is a, a normal, it, it's a very uh, quiet day. And days are not necessarily all um, uh, quiet like this. In fact, there are several problems with acquiring data in a glaciated, uh, in a proglacial lake. One of them is, for example, icebergs. And I'm going to show you a video of en us entering uh, the Brazos Uppsala, which is one of these fjords, and is, and is showing you the variety of icebergs that you might encounter. So icebergs, as you can imagine, this is just the very shallow portions of the ice you see. The ice are actually, this is just uh, uh, 10% of what you're seeing. Most of the ice is submerged. This is the front of Uppsala glaciers. This is this glacier here. And uh, we are collecting data around the iceberg. So all the energy that you are um, uh, emitting into the, into the water is going to bounce off this object and come back at your streamer. 
And so that is one of the many sources of noise that you're gonna encounter in, in, in the data, right? And as you see, this is Glacier Uppsala and these objects are big, some of them enormous. And they, some of them are actually grounded. And the, this, this glacial valley is about 670 meters deep. So the other thing, the other problem is that wind is king in Patagonia. So um, some conditions for uh, data acquisitions are not necessarily very uh, um, uh, optimal. And in fact, we had uh, um, waves that were about five meters high and uh, not every day is good for seismic acquisition. And the other problem is that you're collecting data in very narrow, deep and steep sloped uh, fjords. And so there is a lot of energy that gets captured into that valley. And instead of going down, it is actually reverberating and coming and, and traveling laterally. So a lot of the noise that you will see in the data is this side swipe coming from the side of the valley, not necessarily from the the uh, dumb, you know, vertically traveling. So let's take a look at the data, it's about time. I'm gonna show you a seismic reflection uh, line that runs from the front of the Uppsala glaciers. You're gonna see it on your left, all the way to the um, front of the Herminita moraines. So this is about a 20 kilometers long line. This is um, uh, the Herminita moraine. So we can clearly image the uh, moraineal system that are preserved submerged in under the the, uh, the lake, and what you're seeing here, some of these are fairly, you know, relevant. So, and we can date them because we can actually correlate the very well dated structures on land with the structure that we see on the seismic reflection data, and we can also uh, correlate these ridges with the system of, of uh, with the front of the eyes as mapped by the uh, satellite images during the last century here. So we can see actually in date all these uh, ridges and we can therefore calculate sedimentation rates because we can bound the age and the opening of each of these basin to sedimentation. And so that's actually what we did. And in order to interpret the seismic reflection data, we developed a, um, Glass, glacial lack of string seismostratigraphic uh, uh, phases um, method. And, you know, glacial lack of string sedimentation has essentially two components. And, and I'm, I'm showing you here two, you know, a cartoon that shows the front of the eyes and the sediments that are going to be deposited, just to give you an idea of how we develop this. But usually, you know, we use two components. One is the coarse mixed material that is delivered at the grounding line and is the deposited uh, lake ward, right? By the gravity and flow processes. And this is, you know, predominantly coarse. And so we can de de recognize it because it doesn't have a lot of stratification. This is also the till deposited directly by the ice and the moraineal system ma material. And then there is another uh, type of uh, component that instead is deposited by, by the, uh, the plume and is delivered uh, by the meltwater, right? And is delivered also several kilometers from the grounding line. And this is fine grain and is, uh, and is stratified. And so we mostly uh, define two components, the stratified thrift and the unstratified and coarse uh, material, and then the acoustic basement. So you'll see this in our uh, interpretation. And we develop a system to, uh, to identify them. So we're gonna go through some of these images and I'm gonna show you what we've been doing with them before we go through questions. So this is a line um, acquired here. We're right in front of the, uh, of the um, past, uh, past um, Pearson one. This is where the ice used to be about um, 7,000 years ago. And what you're seeing here, this is, you know, beautiful images of very well stratified uh, sediments and the uh, front of the uh, top of the basement. And we used, you know, seismostratigraphic um, tools, you know, literally a process of principles to identify uh, units with onlap and uh, uh, truncations. And then we assigned our seismic stratigraphic uh, phases interpretation. 
And so, and we, you know, developed this, this technique and we went on what you're seeing here. We can, you can define how thick the sediments are. We can assign the date based on the, uh, on the uh, morainal system and we can define therefore sedimentation rates. I wanna show you another line here. Now we're right in front. This is toward the glaciers. This is where the uh, Pearson uh, one moraine, this is the um, uh, 7,000, 6,000 years old moraines are uh, located. You see these are uh, again, the uh, uh, basement, morainal material, some slump, some probably um, periglacial deposit, uh, some slump, you know, of very uh, modern uh, sediments deposited here. And then again, you know, we can calculate sediment thickness, assign a sedimentation uh, age, a, a sediment age based on the morainal system. And we calculate sedimentation rates in the order of six millimeters a year for this, for this group. And this is based on the fact that this material is only bored of the Arminita moraine, which are 12,000 years, which are located here, right? Okay, let's take a look at the uh, sediments now and, and a line that is much farther to the, uh, much more distal from the ice front. And we're going to be here in the middle of one of the main uh, uh, Brazos. So this is, we are in board of the um, uh, PB3 moraine. These are, they were the moraine, used to, with the ice used to be uh, 13,000 years ago. This is in front of the Younger Dryas uh, moraine. And uh, this is now the ice, the, the, the line, the ice, Front is located to your left, and the the uh, thirteen thousand years old moraine front is to the right. And the first thing that you notice here, again, this is about a twenty kilometers long line, and um, what you see here is this rugged bottom that you see here, and that is, and then this very well stratified uh, material at the top. These are the distal deposits of uh, um, of the uh, sediments that are becoming more and more well stratified as you move away from the ice front, which is, uh, it makes sense. They are going from proximal to more distal. And so we can identify, you know, that different um, uh, phases in the stratigraphy. And one of the things that really was striking to us is that the basement, which we had expected to be very well eroded and very uh, flat, instead is very rugged, right? And so uh, that was one of the first surprises for us. And, uh, and here you see a, a basement uh, side swipe. And the other surprising uh, uh, evidence here that we, we, we noticed is that a lot of these um, sediments here appears to be having the same characteristic. I'm gonna show you in this distal deposit here, the characteristic of this uh, stratification that seems to have a, a repeated sequences of transparent deposit transitioning up to very uh, well layered deposit and then transparent deposit and then a very well layered. As if the, we interpret this as coarse material finding upward and then coarse material and then finding, finding upward. And for we identify about six, eight of these um, sequences that are repeating themselves, you know, from the distal deposit and upward. And we've been wondering for a while what this might mean. And we think that these are actually associated with an oscillation of the grounding line, you know, of the ice as it moves forward and therefore delivers more uh, coarser material and therefore more chaotic and uh, transparent. And then it moves and it retreats and therefore it becomes, it moves away um, and therefore it becomes more distal to this location and then and therefore it finds upward. So I'm gonna show you now instead the chirp data. These are the chirp data that are just in this location that seems to repeat. Now we're gonna go into very high resolution here. And this is, notice there is a very um, a, a strong velocity, um, vertical um, uh, 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 oh my God, I'm blanking out. It, it's much, it's very uh, compressed uh, horizontally. And what you're seeing here, these are the very finely, uh, fi very fine sequences. This is the upper portion of that, 
of that sequence here that shows the chaotic unit and then defining the upward unit here and the, the lower section that shows the very refined sequences here. And we have a uh, borehole, you know, actually we have cores here that help us define what these are. And these actually show that the, this, this core, for example, is uh, about 850 meters in years long and shows a, a, all this material has been deposited in about 800 uh, years. And so it has an, a sedimentation rate that is much slower than the average sedimentation rate that we can calculate for all those sequences. And if we apply the sedimentation rates to the fine sequences all the way to the bottom of the fine sequence are very well layered, we actually think that these sequences might have been deposited during the uh, re-advance at about 1500 years ago. And so we think that these us, this actually seems to confirm the fact that these all these sequences might be the oscillation of the eyes, and all these correspond to movement of the eyes and the difference readvance and retreats of the eyes as recorded by the uh, uh, by the sedimentary record. I'm going to move. I know I'm running late here. Uh, I'm going to show you just two more lines here, perpendicular and. Uh, uh, parallel to the ice movement. And this is now the morainal system left behind when the ice sit here during the last, um, um, the, the younger driest, one, the, the, the first re-advance after the last glacial maximum. And as you see here, this is a, a last, a pretty, a, a, you know, spectacular um, morainal system preserved subaqueously. And what one of the things that we uh, was striking to us is the fact that this, the ice has re-advanced after the last glacial maximum seemed to have not eroded away all the deposited that have been left behind. We know this because as we look now at the ice, at a section that is perpendicular to the ice transport, the ice is now moving you know, into the, uh, into the uh, section. It seems to have left, we see to, seem to be imaging eskers, that means uh, structures that have been left behind subglacially by the ice moving uh, instead of scraping all the material away during the transport. So this is actually uh, pretty uh, uh, unique and we expected instead this material to have been eroded away by, by the ice when it re-advanced during the, the younger dryas. So what are we doing with all this stuff? So the way we are using this, all this um, um, sedimentary record is by calculating uh, retreat rates from erosion rates. So we, we know that there is, it has been reported that there, are, there is a correlation between erosion rates and retreat rates. And we are going to use the, um, the uh, erosion rates are calculated and derived from sediment fluxes used, you know, calculated from these images to then get at the retreat rates as preserved from the sedimentary record and then feed them into the uh, glacial isostatic adjustment models. And so, you know, I'm gonna not, I know I'm running really late. And so I'm going to uh, leave you with the conclusions and I'm going to, uh, you know, ask if there are any questions and I'm really sorry that I went late. Uh, not at all. Thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Uh, very nice images. So the stage is open. You, for... Do you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Okay, I can hear you. Sorry. All right, great. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Great presentation. Uh, nice figures. Uh, the time is open for, uh, for audience. If you guys have any question, please go ahead. Either you can ask uh, or you can uh, send to the uh, chat room, then we should be able to read. Well, I have a question while the graduate students are thinking of their questions. <laughs> um, really fascinating stuff. Uh, maybe if I'm allowed, I could ask two questions. But the first one is about those pulses you were showing us where you think the grounding line is, mm -hmm. is moving. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's pretty convincing or attractive, shall we say, 
because you'd expect also, but yeah, a change, a pulse of new sediment flow in a different type. What, um, yeah, th this one is interesting because it it's not as periodic maybe as the other one because it's higher resolution. The, the first, yeah, the one on the side, right, it, it looks quite periodic. Were you able to calculate, estimate the time in year between those pulses? Time in years between those pulses? So the only way we could do this, actually we don't because our cores are four meters and this is a section that goes all the way down to 230 meters. So we can't, right? So there's really no way that we can assign an age to each of this. And that, that would be great. But yeah. um, one of the way that we could do this is to say, okay, so the eyes is, um, the way I think of it is that if the eyes is, um, is delivering this uh, sediments at the same rate for the well stratified material, and I apply that sedimentation rate to those stratified material, then I don't know, for example, what to assign to this very uh, transparent material here. What sedimentation rate should I assign? I only have long-term average sedimentation rates. So the only way we could date this material is if we drill through this, Yeah. right? That would be, you know, that there is really no way for me to try to date each of these pulses. I want to know that these pulses are the same number of pulses of the system of pulses that the ice has, has moved. So the other things that I was actually thinking is that I was trying to tie this, if this is assuming, this is a record of the climate, then I could link this to a record of changes in temperature as recorded by the um, sediments offshore in mm -hmm. Chile, by IODP record, mm -hmm. right? Changes in uh, Delta O18, for example, mm -hmm. changes in temperature. If these might match, then, because the, the, the restaurant record is destroyed every time the ice advances. Mm -hmm. This record is that it preserves every single movement of the ice. And so that's why I think this might be more complete and therefore correlatable to the, the what is preserved uh, in the oceans. So it sounds like you might have a good follow-on proposal for some, some drilling. <laughs> um, yeah. But then, so there is a lot of drilling offshore, obviously, right? Yeah. But it's uh, the, the but thing is, the to, yeah, yeah. yeah. My second question, if I may fit it in, is uh, I, I'm 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 not so familiar with this part of the world, but I'm familiar with the uh, by Washington State and British Columbia, the the Cascadia subduction zone, and one thing that's very complicated up there is you have this mixture in terms of ground motion, you have this mixture between glacial rebound and everything that, that goes into that uh, and tectonic motion because you have the, the slab subducting there and it's actually doing things like at the, the Western side of Vancouver Island is, is tilting downwards because it's getting dragged by the slab which uplifts the, the eastern side of things. And, and decoupling those things, the glacial rebound from the tectonic motions is, is really complicated. And so I just wondered, since you're in this area and you're in this slab window and everything, what's the situation here in terms of trying to decouple the tectonic motions from the... So clearly there is a component of tectonics that is associated with this lab. So with the subduction, right? So there is an, a component of this uplift is related to the subduction, right? But the, the uplift is so rapid that the dominant signal here is the GIA. So I think that the, um, the way, I'm not the one modeling it, Mm -hmm. But the way Eric Ivins is treating it is that really the dominant um, uh, component and therefore the low-hanging fruit is to try to tease out, you know, what is the, uh, 
the uh, signal of the GIA. And then once we have a good um, modeling for a, a good, good parameters to model the GIA, like a good estimate of the rheology of the mantle, of the structure of the mantle, and a good estimate of the changes in load at the surface, then we can start addressing what component is associated with the subduction. Okay, great. As, especially because the, the, uh, this, the signal of the GIA is possibly, with mantle viscosity so low, is possibly so, um, as it's, it's so rapid and so intense in terms of uh, magnitude that um, it overwhelms any tectonics. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a little different, maybe from uh, yes. Cascadia. Yeah, where they're similar uh, magnitudes. Okay, I'll pass the pass the baton in case grad students or faculty have questions. All right. Um, questions. Uh, in the meantime, I I, I have a I, uh, go ahead. I have a question for Beatrice. Yes, go ahead. Um, Beatrice, can you can you bring up that line that showed those slump features? I think they are this one. Yeah, yeah, that one. Oh yeah. wait, 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 no, wait, wait! You went, but you went past it. Yes, my. I my was way. I was curious about those slumps. Uh, this ones. Yeah, yeah, that one. Those are quite uh, spectacular. And have you just mapped those in this one location, or do they occur? No, they occurred. Uh, in other locations, but they don't seem to be associated with any per, uh, um, particular slope value. Okay, so you don't have any idea what's triggering that? Is it just... Uh, uh, so, you know, this is also a place where that, you know, has earthquakes. So I wonder yeah. if there is a component of, uh, in, you know, slope instability associated with, um, uh, you know, yeah, earthquake. You know, with earthquake, this place just had a five point four. You know, uh, about three weeks ago, okay. just under the lake. So, yeah. um, and possibly associated with the uh, with the GIA, with the subduction zone, with the tectonic. Remember, we are the at the foothills of the of the Andes, and with there are volcanoes around here. So it's a tectonically very active area. So right, and yet. The other question I had about the sedimentology of the lake, I mean, th these lakes are deep. This, they're deep systems, right? Mm -hmm. And so have you, uh, uh, in any, well, you don't have any deep control here, but I was just wondering about what sort of other sedimentological processes might be going on, like turbidites. Yes, uh, absolutely. Turbid yeah. Would that so, be a Go ahead. I think so. I yeah. think so. So there are several several other component uh, to the glacial sedimentation processes that are going on. One is that there are there are slope failures along these uh, valley uh, slopes. Okay. Uh -huh. We know because these valley slopes are actually rebounding mm -hmm. from the ice, and uh, in fact, we pass right along here. So this is the uh, Brasso Uppsala is seven, se about seven hundred meters. This is the deepest core, gravity core that black core has ever collected uh -huh. in 700 meters uh, water. So there is a, a slope failure here that occurred in 2013 because the, the slope is actually rebounding, you know, uh, after right. the ice has, has been removed. So we know that those are periglacial uh, sediments that are being deposited. They have nothing to do with the ice. Uh -huh. Also, what I think, you know, and this is actually the second project that my uh, graduate students is working on, there are remobilization due to earthquakes. Yes. So we should, uh, we expect that some of this material, we may find it ubiquitous uh, everywhere on the lake. Yeah. Right. So, uh, okay. but okay. Thank but you I don't much. expect that stuff to be uh, six meters. So, so yeah. one of the things that we had, you know, I had, uh, suspected, okay, is this material, you know, uh -huh. because, first of all, I don't expect this is six meters of deposit. Yes. That's a lot. That's a lot. That wouldn't be one turbidite, but that would be, yeah. No, I understand. So, yeah. So, so the idea is that there is this idea that when the ice is actually receding, it actually del delivers more uh, um, 
sediments, there is more uh, uh, more flux because it actually uh, there is more water and and it recedes more rapidly and there is more you know it can deliver more uh, sediments even subglacially. So, okay. so. Well, thank you very we're still much. scratching our head. For now, we're calculating erosion rates from sediment flux and retreat rates so that we can give it to the, to the modelers. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, great. Um, I have a, a one quick question, Beatrice, uh, regarding the time lag response between the solid earth uh, deformation and glacier retreat, because I believe that the, 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 the the rate of these two um, events are not equal, is that right? So in that case, the Earth's response, it's gonna be, you know, delay and how you can um, correlate or, you know, use the modern observation that you collect today to the, to the modern uh, deglaciation systems. So you're saying the, the GIA is not instantaneous. That's right. Right, no, it is not. And, and that response depends on the, uh, on the viscosity of the mantle. Right, uh, the signals that we see today, okay, is this signal uh, reflecting the modern deglaciation or it's related to, let's say 500 years ago, 300 years Ex ago? Excellent question. So the idea is that usually, for example, Right now in Northern America, we are seeing the uplift associated with the Laurentide ice sheet that is being deglaciating, right? So mm -hmm. it could be a long time because the viscosity of the mantle is high. Here, the idea is that the viscosity of the mantle is so low because of the slab window that this system is responding to centennial ice changes. I see. So it is instantaneous, you know, geologically speaking, because right. 300 years is instantaneous. This is, we think it might be true, but also it is true that, so it has a very short memory, meaning that everything right. that happened during the last glacial maximum doesn't matter, we think. Right. But obviously you need to put that into the system to really make sure that is true. So that's why we're going all the way back to the last glacial maximum and make sure that we are calculating retreat rates so that we can address whether it's true or not. Because our hypothesis is that this signal is associated with the Little Ice Age, because right. we are assuming that the viscosity of the mantle is very low. I see. So we have to prove that. Right, all right, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if there's other questions. Um, all right, so it seems not. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for accepting. Thank you for having me. Wait, wait. There's a question. Right, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't. It's fast. So, so in Alaska, for example, in the Mount San Elias Mountains, what is happening is that, which is incredibly interesting. I don't know if your speaker was talking about that, but um, the Mount San Elias, okay, Alaska. So what happens there is that um, if you think of Alaska as, first of all, eroding the top 
of a system like that and removing mass and ice elicits a, a you know, it's, it may be unclumping um, faults and therefore might induce seismicity, right? Might perturb the state of stress of the lithosphere and induce seismicity. On all those faults that are favorably oriented with the stress field. So in particular, if you have a, an orogenic system that is built you know, in, in terms of um, the accretionary prism that, that, you know, in the, in the sense of Davis 1979, right? So you have um, a system that is under failure everywhere, right? So it will tend to reach equilibrium every time you perturb it. In Alaska, what is perturbing it is this unloading by the eyes and strong, you know, you know, poor, you know, almost ferocious erosion by the glaciers. So the system is responding by uplifting and by uplifting by uh, triggering movement along the trusts to re reach that equilibrium because it, it is an accretionary wedge. It's sitting on top of a, of a subducting slab, right? It, it could be also here. We haven't seen that seismicity. This area is completely quiet. Right. This is a this this area is a is a quiet subduction zone because you're subducting lithosphere possibly under a uh, a slab window. Again, the mantle is low viscosity, so this is a hot subduction zone in a way. Right. So if you look at the seismicity in this region, you don't have any uh, large earthquakes, and and there are stations. So you know. We could, we could see it. We don't see a lot of earthquakes, not as much as we see them in Alaska, for example. So there must be something that is, some people think that the ice is actually shielding the, the basement and uh, in some areas, like at the center of the, of the ice fields. David. Yes, yeah, I had a follow-up question with, when you were discussing with Lowell, those slump features, if you don't mind going back to that slide, as, as you two were discussing, um, once you get, yeah, I think I see uh, at least over uh, underneath the label towards the glaciers, those features, it, it looks like there might be small throw faults going all the way down to the to that basement structure. And so that made me think, as you two were discussing, it, I wonder if, see what you think about this, but I wonder if if you've got rebound, then you then you can have a little bit of flexing and and that might produce a little bit of tensile, uh, fracturing, not fracturing, but, you know, tensile uh, motion on the sediments and given the slope profile there, it, it, it could possibly cause cracking, if you want to think of it that way, up, all the way up through the sediments, just like you might take a cake and flex it a little bit upwards. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, anyway, obviously this is just a slide and you've looked at the data a lot. Do you see those faulting features at the lake bottom um, going all the way down deeper in the sediments, or is that just a kind of a visual? <laughs> um, so we don't see, so we, the, 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 I thought about that. We see very few um, faults. So that's why, you know, one of the things that is surprising to me is that this is one of the very few places where we see these structures and we see mm -hmm. that on a slope where the, on the main lake, the lake floor is flat, undisturbed, which instead is where I will expect that the, the lake is actually perpendicular to the cordillera. So if there was any flexing, I will expect to observe those faults to be most prominent there. Uh -huh. And instead I don't. Okay. 
especially because we do see terraces and those terraces are tilted. Mm -hmm. So there is tilting, but it's not producing visible faults, at least not all the way to the lake floor. There are some, for example, here, and then probably you guys, but here, for example, you see this um, even here, oops, even here, you see this, we interpret this as faults. Okay. We see if that's how actually how, what we interpret, but yeah. they're not that many. Right. So to be a place that is sitting on top of the subduction zone uh, it, on the edges of the, on the foothill of the, so this is the four, four land of the Andes. So, you know, surprisingly on the four. Okay. And then this slide and the other one also shows some, some kind of isolated bright spots in the shallow sediments. Do you think it's biogenic gas? So, something? okay, so I, I should have not deleted that, that slide. I'm gonna show it to you. So we actually see um, what I, I interpreted as gas in the chirp data. I mean, with the completely, um, wiping out of the signal under the bright spots. And okay. um, now gas in this region is not really common because it's too cold. So yeah. there is not a lot of biogenic material that can really produce gas. However, and in fact, the only place where we see this wiping out and the four interpreted this as gas is right uh, offshore of Calafate, which is the large uh, city. So there, and uh, there is a, uh, a plume of sediments that comes from one of the river that might be draining part of the material uh, from the sea. But, and sedimentation rates are really fast here. In fact, they are faster than, than we had expected within the range of uh, expected in Patagonia, but they are very fast. And so maybe that is, you know, the reason why that there, is, there might be some biogenic material there to produce the gas. Oh, but yes, we do see some wiping some 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 possible signal that is associated right. with gas interesting thank you right um uh, Beatrice, uh thank you very much for accepting giving for this presentation uh it was great we we're happy having you at ut dallas and uh thanks, thanks again so thank you um, for having me Yes, and good luck right. on the cruise. Yeah. Good luck on your cruise, Beatrice. Yes. All Let's right. hope we don't have to dock in Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be warmer than this cruise that you showed us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not as welcoming, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank, Thank you great. so much. Have a safe trip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Recording stopped.